Two years ago, I was in the city of Atlanta, Georgia. I was in the city of Atlanta for the purpose of GenSend. GenSend is a program that sends college students out into big cities, inner cities, such as Atlanta, um, Boston, New York, you know, that, uh, that sort of city, to uh, send them to reach people within those contexts. But in reaching those people in those contexts, it teaches college students to live on mission. And if you're really, really called, you'll start to do church planting in those inner cities, if you're interested enough. So while I was in Atlanta, my wife, now wife, Madeline, was with me, uh, well, was not with me, but she was uh, with me in spirit uh, in Lynchburg, Virginia. And she had just started her new job as an EMT and just moved into her apartment off campus. Before I went to Atlanta, I helped her settle in and get everything good and nice and well. And then oh, about two weeks in, I was like, hey, we should um, start FaceTiming each other three or four times a week just to see how each other are doing and having that support system. So we started it early on in the week. Well, FaceTimed her, and uh, she called me, and she was so excited. And I was like, babe, what are you excited for? And she was like, I went to the animal rescue today, and I got to play with cats. And I was like, Awesome. Great. I was like, man, that's a great time. I'm glad that you're, uh, you get to spend time with cats and get to have an outlet, you know, from work and just being at home alone. She's like, yeah, it was great. I'm like, awesome. And she's like, I want a cat. And I was like, you want a cat? Like, buy one? Yeah, I want to buy one. Well, you know, there are priorities and responsibilities to having a cat, right? Yeah, but I'm just excited. I really love these cats. They're great. I want one of them. I'm like, okay, but you know there are priorities and responsibilities that come with taking care of a cat, right? She's like, yeah. Well, I continued to proceed to tell her, hey, you got to take care of this cat. You understand you, you've got to pay money for this cat. Yeah. Well, eventually I convinced her, okay, you're not going to get this cat. Call cool. a little while later in the week. And I open the phone, open FaceTime, and I see a big black and white cat looking at me. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, are you at the animal rescue? She zooms out. It's in her apartment. I'm like, oh, you're cat sitting. No, she bought the cat. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, really? I, I was frustrated. I was like, really, you're going against my advice to not get this cat. I wanted to get a cat a few years later until we're settled and ready to settle down but she was ready to get this cat now. So, proceed to the end of the summer. I come back to Lynchburg to finish my last year at Liberty. And uh, the first night I get back, I wanted to come home and cook her a nice dinner. So I come over, and I'm cooking dinner, and the cat sneaks up, rubbing on me, you know, I'm purring, and I'm like, oh, okay, okay, you're a nice cat, I get it, I get it. You're trying to make friends with me. I know you see me as an enemy, but we're friends. So, uh, few, as days go on and as weeks go on, you know, the cat, you know, is still very kind to me. And one day, after a long, hard day of school and work and all, all of that goes on there, I was like, I'm going to go to Madeline's apartment and crash and take a nap. So I crashed on her couch, and I took a two-hour nap. I wake up, and there's this big fur ball right next to my face, and she is purring. And that was the moment where I was like, I love this cat. <laughs> and there's no getting away from it. And now she's a crucial part of our family. Her name is Penny. She's two years old, and she is the highlight of my life. <laughs> no, I'm recently married, too. So, but I, I want to highlight something, though. There is a hesitancy that occurs when God calls us out into the uncomfortable zone much like how he used the cat to challenge my doubt. He was drawing us out into unknown territory where we do not know where we're going next. This demands that we stick closer together now more than ever and treat each other as if we're family and push each other to the calling that God has designed for us where we are called into a new role of not just supporting one another, but sending one another on mission, where we become a tight-knit 
family, that disciples one another into becoming a disciple maker. God wants us, First Norfolk, to see that the church fulfills her calling when we send members on mission. Turn your Bibles or turn in your Bible app to Acts 12, and we'll be starting in verse 24. So you guys are turning there. Since Easter, we have understood how the early church informs us of how we should live our calling as a family. Uh, we have journeyed through the highs and lows of what this early family went through and how they responded to each situation. In Acts 7, we marveled at the boldness of Stephen and how he showed tremendous courage in sharing the gospel despite adversity. This Courage led him to being stoned and killed. This persecution spread to the entire church in Jerusalem, and they were scattered and killed and, and, and imprisoned as well. But the message continued to spread. This widespread message eventually got to the leading persecutor, Saul, in Acts 9. We, see, oh, we saw that a couple weeks ago. Saul, who was a persecutor of Jesus, became a propagator of Jesus. The calling of Saul to reach the world then tread the way for the gospel to make its way to the ends of the earth in Acts 10. This is met with cultural opposition, though. In chapter 11, God sent Barnabas to, uh, to bridge the gap. This message continued to spread. The newfound worry in, uh, uh, worried some, um, and uh, King Herod Agrippa decided... I'm going to kill this entire movement. So he tries to kill the leaders of the church, uh, especially James and Peter. He kills James and then imprisons Peter. He succeeds at doing both, but God intervened, and he, and he liberated Peter from prison and killed King Herod. The message continued to spread. And we'll read here in verse 24, it, read with me, it says, but the word of the Lord continued to grow and be multiplied. Since the word of the Lord growed and multiplied through all the turmoil, we see that the, Lord of, uh, uh, the word of the Lord has power beyond our imagination. This means that the word of the Lord is the gospel, and the gospel is our motivation. The gospel is our motivation. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news the way of Jesus, the life-altering, soul-transforming, identity-defining story of the redemption of God. The redemption of God's children as a ransom for their rebellious souls. That though we were created by God for the purpose of worshiping God, we decided to worship ourselves instead. We substituted our fulfillment in God for the worship of ourselves. We ran away from God, but God ran after us. Amen. He chased us in the way of his son, Jesus Christ. He was perfect in all ways, yet existing in human form. He met us in our dire weakness. He walked this earth and carried a cross that he would die on. On that cross, he carried our self-worship, our rebellion, our sin upon his body and endured the punishment that we deserved, that we were running towards. He chose to take on the suffering of the world, though he didn't deserve an inch of pain. He did it anyway because he loved us. That isn't the end, though. He rose from that grave three days later. His divine power and glory were manifested through his resurrection. After a few days on earth, he ascended to the Father in heaven. His victory and his resurrection and his ascension are, is, becomes our victory that we hold on to in times of trouble. Even though we don't, get it, we don't deserve a share in God's glorious work, he, he gives it to us anyways because he loves us and it's for his glory. That message, that story, that truth becomes our motivation because of God's unfailing love towards us. He has rescued us. So we must make it our motivation to tell others about this rescue. The gospel is our motivation. 
Despite the inconvenience, despite the famine, despite the struggle, the difference, the opposition, the chaos, the persecution, the suffering, the adversity, the gospel stands true. The gospel continues to spread. The gospel continues to multiply. Like a seed planted into the field, the adverse conditions didn't stop the gospel from spreading. It didn't stop it from growing into communities and all across the world because God is the one at work. He is the one that causes it to grow. Whatever the ideologies of this world throw at us, we realize that God is more than powerful enough to spread the gospel. A growing and multiplying gospel demands, it demands a sending church. This means we have no no excuse to sit on our hands and cross our legs. It gives us no excuse to judge someone else of their inactivity. It gives us no excuse to just stand by and consume. We have no excuse at all. If the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, we must spread it. When I say we, that includes me, and that includes you. It includes us as a unit, as a family. We are called to spread it. God has chosen us as laborers, as instruments for spreading the gospel. There is no other means for his word to be spread. If his gospel endures under the severest of conditions, God will always spread it. He will always win. In verse 25, the scripture says, And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their mission, taking along with them John, who was also called Mark. When Saul and Barnabas finished their mission, their relief mission, that is, to Jerusalem, as we saw in Acts 11, they came back to Antioch. Antioch was their home church. They were coming home to report what the Lord had done. I think of this as like a uh, short-term mission trip where you go to a specific place, you have a specific purpose and mission, including sharing the gospel, and you come back to report what God had done. When Saul and Barnabas came back, though, they knew they weren't going to be back for long. Saul knew that he was called to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth. When he was called to salvation, God even said, he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the sons of Israel. He knew he was not done yet, whereas Barnabas and John Mark were not as expectant. They weren't expecting a call. Saul, Barnabas, and John Mark came home because though the short-term mission had ended, the gospel mission never ends. The gospel demands that we are committed to spreading and multiplying it. They come home, and they come home to, read with me in verse 1, it says, At Antioch, the church that was there, prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, and Manian, who'd been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. They came back to a family that had diverse gifts and diverse backgrounds, and their family was fully equipped to reach their city with where they were. They had people from North Africa to Europe to Asia to you, you name it. They were there. They were participating and they had prophets and teachers. But they were not a diverse family for the sake of diversity. They were a diverse family because they were adamant about the gospel. The gospel was their motivation. The mission demands that we go to the ends of the earth and reach whoever we can with the gospel, like Tim said last week. The mission, the gospel, is for them too. That meant, we were to go, that meant they were to go to the nations and encounter people who didn't think alike of them. That meant they were to go to different communities and encounter different cultures. That meant they were to go love on people who didn't share their worldview. That meant they were to learn foreign concepts and understand the hearts of people who are far from God. That meant they were to meet people where they were because Jesus met them where they were. And if Jesus meets us where we are, we are to meet people where they are. 
When we realize that the gospel is, the, it, is our motivation, like the Antioch church did, we will start to make disciples to be missional. Missionaries, I'm sorry. When we make disciples to be missionaries, we become a sending church. Verse 2, the beginning of verse 2 says, while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting. Some of your translations will say, uh, minister to the Lord. Um, Some will say, uh, praising unto the Lord. Uh, And some will also say, worshiping the Lord. Worshiping the Lord is what they were doing. They were worshiping the Lord as if it was a Sunday morning church service like we do today. They were singing songs of praise. They were praying and they were, um, and they were preaching and administering the word. Specifically though, I want to point out that they were fasting. This is where a body of people, a, 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 a bunch of individuals coming into an entity become family. You see, fasting is eliminating a source of nourishment from this world to allow for nourishment from God. We are deepening our hunger and awareness for God when we fast. While the text does not reveal the explicit purpose to what they were fasting for, we know what resulted of this fasting. Read with me, it says in verse 2, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. What resulted was God's voice. God called out Barnabas and Saul for the special work of the gospel. He was sending them out to go on mission to the ends of the earth to do the work of the gospel. Because they were intentionally seeking the Lord together as a family unit, not just as mere individuals working together. No, A family unit, together. They were together in everything. They were sacrificing everything. Because they were together as a family unit, God spoke. Some of us are reading this and thinking, though, okay, so how does this benefit the Antioch church? And what I asked for myself was, how does this benefit me? I'm not called to long-term missions. I'm not going to a specific country and uh, ministering the gospel to these specific people. I'm not called to that sort of thing. So how does this sort of thing benefit me? Why should I fast? Why should I do any of these things? You see, we filter our life in group matters through an individualistic perspective. It's how we grew up. It's how we're wired. I know that I search for how anything may benefit me. Uh, whether that is someone in our church going to Malawi or uh, 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 the homeless ministry going out into communities, I want to see, I measure my joy based upon how things pan out for me. So if there's a team going to Malawi, how does that benefit me? If there's a homeless team going out into the community, how does that benefit me? I tend to think this way. How it may benefit me in the long run, how does it affect me? The individuals, and this is what was so convicting to me, the individuals of the church in Antioch were not concerned about their well-being. They were 100% sold out for their family. Man, that's an indictment against me. How often do I do that? When they saw their family members living to the potential of their calling and living on mission, they rejoiced. We should be doing the same thing for each other. Why are we so concerned about the medial matters that we miss the mission? God is on the move in our family. Do we realize that? That God is on the move within our family. That there is something amazing going on here. God wants us to partake in a movement that's greater than ourselves. He wants us to identify with his family and grow within his family. I believe that verse 3 gives us great application for how we can send disciples to be missionaries. Read with me in verse 3, the beginning. Then when they had fasted and prayed. By their fasting and praying, we make disciples through relentless dedication to one another. The church of Antioch prayed and fasted even after hearing the voice of God. 
They were participating in Bar- with Barnabas and Saul in their mission by fasting from their comforts and asked for the move of God through this journey. They were full send. They were all in for their members, even for just two members. Are we? Are we fully committed to one another where we would commit to this level for one another? Would we go to the extent of yielding some of our preferences for someone else's growth to walk with them in their suffering? to bear their pains and share in their victories, we should be committed. Jesus is calling us to this type of relationship with one another. To some of us today, God is calling us to take a big step, a step that requires faith, a step that requires us to get out of our comfort zone, being vulnerable and opening yourselves up to someone else, a commitment to discipleship, A commitment to someone in our church who needs our hand in desperate need. A commitment from being a friend to now becoming family. He is calling some of you to that today. Don't run away. God will be with you through it all. Some of us, though, have been legitimately hurt by someone who took advantage of our dedication. If that has happened to you, I'm sorry. Sincerely sorry. I have been there. It hurts. It it pains me inside. It leaves deep wounds. But God is with you in this hurt. I pray that God works in your life to be able to get to this level of trust again. I hope that God, who has never betrayed us, nor has he ever forsaken us, heals you of that wound. I pray that God will supernaturally work in your life to be able to trust us as a family again. I encourage you to talk to one of our ministers if you're feeling hurt. You should never walk through this alone. We can help walk you through some of this hurt. Those of you who have experienced this pain, this hurt, may feel the urge to commit and trust again today. Praise God for you taking that step of faith and entrusting yourself to the good of this family. We celebrate in God's unfailing love for us. In our relentless dedication to one another, We also make disciples through unconditional support. Read with me in verse 3 at the last part. And laid their hands on them, and they sent them away. You see, when you lay hands on someone, like when we commission someone to go off on a missionary journey, you are not only asking for God's blessing upon these people as they go, but you are personally affiliating yourself with that person. You have witnessed this person grow into the image of Jesus. You have been with them in their struggle. You have been with them in their despair. You are confirming that they are called, assured that God is going to use them plentifully as they're going on mission. This affiliation is you saying, I've watched this person grow, and I've been alongside them in their journey, both good and bad. And they are met. They are called to go on mission. This attachment is familial. It's brother and sister-like. A familial attachment requires us to ask this question. When you look around the room, and I encourage you to look around the room, are we confident that we have participated in someone else's life here and been alongside them in their growth? the graduates we saw on stage last week, the scattered church that we saw last week, the the, the families dedicating their babies, the future mission teams that are about to go out, we are with them. It's not just a bunch of individuals. We as a family are participating with them. We are alongside them in their journey. 
All of them are being sent out into the world to spread and multiply the word of the Lord. Will we not just support them, but send them? Supporting means that we can bow out, we can retreat as we please. Sending means that we are all in and that we stick with them through the trials. This is what the church of Antioch did for Saul and Barnabas and what God is asking from us today. When I was 13 years old, I went to a church camp at Liberty University with my old church. It was church camp business as usual. I was saved and already had a relationship with Jesus. I was more praying for those who didn't know Jesus to be saved, especially in my youth group. And if God did something with me throughout, the journey, throughout that week, cool, I was happy. Well, God definitely did something with me in, during that week. That Thursday night, I, uh, we were at the message, and I could not tell you what the message was about. I'll be honest, I really didn't know. But I remember in the middle of the message, I was overcome, and I started weeping. I mean, losing it. I was weeping. I couldn't tell you why. The only thing that I knew was that God was burdening my heart for people who didn't know Jesus and would never hear his name. And that they would spend eternity not with him. That broke my heart. It ripped me to shreds. And I remember my minister took me out, my youth minister took me outside <laughs> He was just trying to calm me down, you know. I was weeping. I was just, I was crying. And I was speechless. And I remember him trying to comfort me. And there was a point whenever I was crying where I stopped crying and I started preaching. And I started preaching the word. And I, it was unexplainable. I don't know. I don't know why. But I just started opening the word and quoting scripture. And that's what I wanted to do. A few weeks later, my youth pastor meets up with me after, you know, you recover from camp, and uh, he said, Seth, you're called to ministry, and I said, no, I'm not. I ran away from that calling. Why? Because it was intimidating. It intimidated the mess out of me, and I remember going throughout my teenage years into my adult years, when I, from my old church all the way to here at First Norfolk, when I joined in my junior year of high school, there were people in my life, who would tell me, Seth, you're called to ministry. And I couldn't escape it. It was one of those things. And I couldn't run away from it. God was chasing after me. And he's wanting me to serve in the ministry. And I'm here today because of those people. I'm not here because of gifts. I'm not here because I'm qualified. To be honest, I'm here because God rescued me. And God rescued me and the church was there to send me. Some of you here today are being called. Some of you are being called to salvation. As the worship team comes up, if you're being called to salvation today, if, you, if this is the first time you want to trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, as someone who you want to put your full trust in for the rest of your life and abandon everything else? As we're worshiping, I pray that you come up here to this altar and give your life to Christ today. But some of us today are also being called to a some form of ministry. Whether that's service, whether that's vocational ministry, or maybe even mission. We're called to do ministry in some way, shape, or form. And I challenge you to come up on this altar and lay down all of your seemingly maybe selfish desires and give it to Jesus. Because Jesus is going to take that and use it for his good. I pray that today some of your lives will change from going from just supporting to sending. Let's pray. 
God, we bow before you and we give you praise for all that you've done in our life. That Jesus, you are the author and perfecter of our faith. And God, that today will be a transformative day for some. That some will put their trust in you and leave their life worshiping themselves. Or some will put their trust in you today and finding fulfillment in your calling for their life. God, we worship you for your gospel and that it never ends, it never stops. And that God, you are with us until the end of the age. You are holy, holy, holy. And God, we rejoice and we bow before you and give our praise. We ask these things in your name. Amen.